back in 2014, I wrote an article for Slate about why my fetish is my sexual orientation. That article got a lot of attention, but in hindsight, I have to admit it's not the best thing I've ever written. First, I was young, and I was only just beginning to build and understand the language terms and concepts that we would need to have these conversations in the first place. Second, when I wrote that article, I was still way too scared of Twitter. Looking back at it today, half of that article reads like an apology or disclaimer. But I'm older now. And sorry, I'm not sorry anymore. But I'm not entirely out of the woods yet. Once a year, someone on Twitter finds that article, gets caps lock outraged, and I lose a whole day dealing with the ensuing meltdown. It's all very boring, and I don't want to do it anymore. But the question of whether a fetish is a sexual orientation does matter. A lot. The term sexual orientation has that whole born this way, it's not a choice connotation that is useful for sociopolitical reasons including children's rights, which, maybe you guys have heard, I kinda care about. So, I'm going to make this video, post it, and stop arguing with eggs on the internet about whether my innate, unchosen, and lifelong sexual orientation exists. This video is what I have to say on the subject, so I better make this one good. Objection 1. Stop changing the definition of sexual orientation. If you want to talk about definitions, you're playing with semantics. And that, my friend, just happens to be my favorite game. So let's play. Sexual orientation is a political and sociological term. Political and sociological terms aren't fixed. They're just ways for humans to understand, express, define, and organize themselves and that kind of thing evolves. A lot of political and sociological terms have become more expansive and inclusive in recent years. I'm thinking now of terms like marriage, man, woman, and they. When it comes to sexual orientation, even social scientists struggle to nail down a single definition. According to this article by Dr. Randall Sell, the director of the Program for LGBT Health at Drexel University, quote, at present, it is clear that researchers are confused as to what they are studying when they assess sexual orientation in their research. Several literature reviews have found that researchers' conceptual definitions are rarely included in reports of their research. And when they are included, they often differ theoretically. Later, he writes, quote, Today's preferred terms, and even the term sexual orientation itself, have a wide variety of definitions in the literature. So look, it's just not true that I'm changing the definition of sexual orientation, because the reality is there is not one single widely agreed upon definition for me to change. But like I said, political language is mostly just a way for humans to organize themselves. So if you want to pull up the ladder and organize in such a way that excludes me and people like me from your clubhouse concept of sexual orientation, that's your prerogative. But I'm not going to let you fall back on cop-outs like but the definition because that's just not how political language works. Objection number two. Sexual orientation is about who you love, not how you love. Yes, obviously, sexual orientation is about who we love. But that's not the whole story. If it were, everyone would be bi or pan, because everyone has people of a variety of genders in their lives that they love friends, family members, Shakespeare characters, whatever. But that's ridiculous. Everyone loves people of a variety of genders, but that doesn't make everyone bi or pan because there is a difference between platonic love and sexual love. And when we talk about sexual orientation, we're talking about sexual love. But what is it that makes sexual love and platonic love different? Because, you know, in many ways, they're exactly the same. Love is... You know, making a pot of soup for someone who's sick. Love is curiosity and concern. Love is selflessness, sacrifice, and a billion other tiny details that shape love in both its platonic and sexual forms. Even if you'd rather remove a touchy-feely term like love and replace it with the word attraction, my point still stands. Sexual attraction 
is different than platonic attraction. So where does this critical transformational difference come from? What is that one key ingredient that makes sexual love or attraction different from platonic love or attraction, and therefore applicable to sexual orientation? What makes the way we love our friends different than the way we love our partners? What makes the way we love our families different than the way we love our partners? What makes the way I love a half-man, half-fish from a 17th century play by a dead English white guy different from the way I love my partners? Seriously, how good is the soundtrack from Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet? That's right. The difference between sexual love and platonic love is the how. That means how we love is just as relevant to conversations about sexual orientation as who we love, because the how is what separates the platonic from the sexual. It just hasn't been talked about very much yet because, as I've said in previous videos, we live in a sex-centric society. The how of sexual orientation has always just been assumed to be sex. But fetishists, that is, people who are oriented towards an object, identity, or activity that is not sex, know that for a minority of us, sex is not the how. For me, the how that makes my experience of sexual attraction different from my experience of platonic attraction is spanking. And spanking occupies the same place in my life that sex occupies in the lives of sex-oriented people. So here's what I propose. Everyone knows the Kinsey scale, right? At one end of the scale, we have the number zero. People who fall at that point on the scale are exclusively heterosexual. At the other end of the scale, we have the number six, those people are exclusively homosexual. And there are all these other points in the middle of the spectrum for people who experience varying degrees of bisexual attraction. We could quibble about flaws in the Kinsey scale, but you know, I'm trying to keep this video tight. So for now, suffice it to say, the Kinsey scale does also include an X for people with quote, no sociosexual contacts or relations. If you want to read more about whether that X qualifies as an accurate classification of asexuality or not, check out The Psychology of Human Sexuality by Dr. Justin Laymiller. Like I said, I'm trying to keep this video tight. The bottom line is, the Kinsey scale does a pretty good job covering the axis of who we love. But this concept of sexual orientation is incomplete. The Kinsey scale needs another axis. The Kinsey scale needs space for how we love. I'm going to call it the Keenan scale. That's right, I named it after myself. Like the Kinsey scale, I'll number it zero to six. People who fall at the zero point on the spectrum are exclusively sex oriented. People who fall at the six point on the spectrum are exclusively oriented towards an object, identity, or activity that is not sex. In a word, fetishists. And all these other points on the how axis are for kinky people, basically. People who are oriented towards both sex and something that is not sex. When I'm drunk, I call them bi-actual. Bi, bi -ac -act -tual. Get it? Because they're into both the act of sex and, and to another by actual, yeah, um, that one's hard to say. That one's not gonna catch on. So on this scale, I'd be like a three on the who axis and a six on the how axis, since I'm exclusively fetish oriented and generally don't really care about gender at all. I'd put Christian Grey like here maybe, since he's exclusively heterosexual, right? and sort of into flogging, I think, but like, let's be honest, he's mostly into sex. And Shakespeare clearly goes right here at the white hot center of sexual gluttony. Home Skillet wants all of it. Objection number three. Calling your gross fetish and orientation cheapens the legacy of LGBTQIA struggles. No, it doesn't. People who say this are making the same mistake as people who claimed that the same-sex marriage rights movement cheapened the legacy of the interracial marriage rights movement. Increased visibility for one group does not dim the lights on any other group. Sexual orientation isn't Noah's Ark. There's 
room for all of us on board. I also want to say this. I say my sexual orientation is fetishist because I'm only attracted to a fetish and gender and sex are irrelevant to that attraction. But people who reject this premise and want to force a more widely recognized sexual orientation label on me would probably say I'm bisexual, since I practice my sexuality with both people of my own gender identity and people of other gender identities. So if you're going to insist that I am bisexual, then I am going to insist that I hold a space in the LGBTQIA community, and therefore, according to your rules, am entitled to my opinion. In the absence of one single definition of sexual orientation, here are my three key ingredients. Innate, unchosen, and lifelong. To steal Shakespeare's words, it is a never fixed mark. I didn't choose my fetish any more than sex-oriented people choose to be into sex. It's just the way we are. My fetish has been there for as long as I can remember, and I assume it will be there for the rest of my life. It's my sexual orientation. But if that makes Twitter ragey, that's really not my problem anymore. I'm on YouTube now. And YouTube is nice, right?